Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. Uh, really short introduction today because we just did talk quite a long time and it was just such fun. Uh, uh, this week's uh, guest on the show is um, a, a, a really good friend of the Fully Charged Show. Uh, Dave Borles runs a wonderful website called Just Have a Think, where he just has a think like a proper think with proper research with talking to people who are relevant to the topic about a, a wide array of scientific topics but i think focused very much on the energy transition and what we're going through around the world now and dave was recently uh, chairing uh, uh, um, uh, group discussions at the, the uh, Everything Electric show in London, and we'll be doing so again very shortly at the Everything Electric show in Harrogate. And then again, much later this year, he'll be doing it at Everything Electric in Farnborough. So we see a lot of Dave, and he is such a, a, a ray of hope and a joyous person to talk to. And I really uh, can't recommend his, his series uh, strongly enough. Um, Just Have a Think is a brilliant YouTube channel. It's really worth having a look at it and subscribing if you haven't done already, and you probably have already, because he's very successful and very popular. Um, that's all I really want to say about it, because the conversation is wide-ranging and fascinating and uh, and ends on a on an optimistic note, even though we go to some dark places. Um, so that's all. And please do check out all the links. All the links to all the stories we talk about are in the show notes for this, and all the links to... Uh, how you can come and jo uh, join in the fun at the Harrogate show uh, in a few weeks. Um, but, but that's it. So please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Dave Borlase. Like Everything Electric? You'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric expos around the world. Come join us in Harrogate, Farnborough and Vancouver. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free. Dave, thank you so much for taking time out to join this. I just want to say right at the top that I have seen you really recently, but it doesn't feel like it. Indeed. Because I kept see, like I'd see you across a crowd, there'd be a load of people talking to you, or I'd see you on stage, or we'd walk past each other at Everything Electric in London. I think we did speak, but for like four seconds. I mean, yeah. it was a bit manic, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Because so, I was, I was, I'd just been, I was waxing lyrical as lyrical as I can, on my introduction to the last episode we did about how amazing it is when the whole team and everyone involved gets together. And I went, well, I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> like ships passing in the night, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. No, it was a shame, but it was fun, wasn't it? I had a great, great. time. At yeah. Yeah. I thought the quality of... Uh, I mean, it was great from being a host, I must say. So I really yeah. enjoyed oh, that. Oh, good. I'm glad um, you enjoyed that. Good. I like, quite like asking the questions and then watching other people squirm around trying to answer yeah. them. That's quite good fun uh, from a sadistic point of view. But but also, I thought the quality of the the um, certainly on the on the panels that I was fortunate Amazing, to host, the quality of the of the contributors was absolutely outstanding. It yeah. Really, really made it so easy to, to be the host because you know yeah. you knew you had the you know the wealth of knowledge that it wasn't going to be a problem. So yeah, yeah superb, we, superb. We have to take our hats off to Frances, who organises all the talks and gets all the panellists. I mean, she does such an amazing job. She yeah. is really exceptional. No, it is, it is wonderful. No, good. I don't want to go on about it more, too much, but uh, no, it was it was a, a yeah, it was very uplifting. It was, you know, and generally. congratulations. To, I mean, to you and the team because it's the first one in London, of course, and it's a big old yeah. event, a big big venue. Um, must have been quite an undertaking. Well, more than quite an undertaking, and extraordinary. So, so yeah. to get it to get it done and nailed and so successful as well, yeah. um, you know, brilliant, brilliant effort by it's all. Always all the, it's always when I go in the day before when it's it's absolute chaos. Yeah. You couldn't believe how rubbish it looked like. Well, this is it. We've this time we've screwed it. It's just not ready. We can't open the doors tomorrow morning. Yeah, and then you, I leave at about six or seven o'clock at night, and there's drilling and sawing and hammering and people doing all kinds. Of, and then you come in the next morning; it's immaculate. I mean, yeah. how does that? It but always they're used to it. They do it all the time, so they, you know, it's just yeah, oh, it always gets done. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, but there's some there's some interesting stories. I just want because I just wanted to talk to you really about things that aren't necessarily all car related, right. because you're proper clever. But I oh. was. Um, <laughs> But there's, there's quite a lot of uh, documentation coming out about the UK and specifically the UK becoming, you know, the possibility of it being 100% renewably powered. And there's that, and I did find that quite interesting uh, parliamentary document, which was actually, it's evidence from Greenpeace, isn't it? That's what, yes. uh, you know, because I was looking through all, I mean, the trouble is hundreds and thousands of papers about this, but there's been another report which is which was allied to the um, 
national grid, which was saying roughly the same thing. Yeah. You know, of how it's possible to be 100% renewably powered without anything else. And I've always quietly agreed with sort of nuclear proponents who go, yeah, well, you need baseload. And then you talk to someone who goes, baseload's a total myth. You don't need baseload. We can do it without, you know. So I, it's one of those things where actually I don't think it's science. I think at the moment it is still opinion with some science on the side. But I don't know. I'm open. I'm happy to have nuclear power plants. I think, well, I, I mean, my, I'm pretty, I'm not, I, I used to say I was agnostic. I think I said that last time we spoke, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm, slight, I'm slightly less than agnostic about nuclear. I, I think that closing existing nuclear power, perfectly serviceable existing oh, nuclear dumb. power plants yeah. is, is madness. Yeah. Um, but I, having done a couple more videos since you and I last spoke a year or two right. ago uh, and spoken to some very knowledgeable people, not least of whom were two very knowledgeable chaps in Canada, who you may know, Paul Martin and Michael Barnard. So Paul right. Martin is a is a thirty five year plus um, chemist in the in the um, petrochemical industry, right. and who advises mainly is very specialises in how hydrogen how hydrogen works in the petrochemical industry to clean things up and and make things into other things and all the rest of it. Um, and Michael Barnard is a very equally experienced um, industry analyst, and and right. they write extensively for things like Clean Technica and, and their own blogs and Facebook. Right. And, and I talk to them quite a lot because they, I find their knowledge quite useful. Um, yeah. And um, so they, they, uh, they on nuclear, they, uh, I, I did a video on small nuclear reactors, which of course we know is the big buzzword at the moment. Rolls Royce yeah. are trying to get them in and all the rest of it and saying, this is how we're going to do nuclear. It's going to be, we're just going to have a little one. Yeah. Nothing's going to go wrong with a little one. It's only little. Yeah. And we'll put, put, one, put one of those by each town. It'll be absolutely fine. Yeah. And, you know, so quite apart from the like, oh God, what if someone wants to, you know, bomb yeah. the town? I mean, that's a bit of a scaremongering tactic. Yes. What about the security risk? But actually, what Paul Martin and Michael Barnard say is having they've crunched the, all these numbers, and they're basically saying, and Paul Martin in particular, having worked in in the, in the nuts and bolts of industry, you know, getting yeah. his hands oily and dirty with proper, you know, gruff the old men saying, well, "How do I fix this blaming pipe?" Yeah, he said it's just the economies of scale of of you know a bigger pipe and 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 you know making ten small nuclear reactors is way way more expensive it's than making one be. nuclear yeah. reactor that's the same size as ten smaller ones because you need yeah. ten more welders you need ten more fitters you need ten more electricians you right. need you know ten more pipes you can one big pipe's not much more expensive than one little one so if you need ten little ones it's yeah. going to be you know, so there's just economies of scale that simply probably will kill nuclear small nuclear. Yeah, be before it really gets off the ground, and and I think that's what Rolls Royce are finding. They obviously they've been making nuclear um, power for submarines for submarines. donkey's years, but and, the budget, and, but the budget is very safe, well. They, you know, I mean, they, they work and they're safe, yeah. but the bud the budget is we need this, Unknown. please, and the government says yes, okay. Well, yeah. you know, the great British public isn't quite as forgiving as that. You know, no, and if you no. can't get a strike price below probably I don't know eighty pounds a megawatt, megawatt hour, they're at ninety four pounds I think a megawatt hour for for. Um, yeah. the ones that are building at the moment, compared to offshore wind at £48 per megawatt hour, it's yeah. just not going to work. No, no, you're not going to buy it. If you're a big industry buying electricity, you're not going to buy the nuclear stuff. It's too expensive. Yeah. So, 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 so because, I think we keep what we've got, but yeah. prob probably, probably unlikely. In the, in the next 100 years or so, it's kind of, I think it's doubtful it will be used. I mean, one of the ones that I loved was a guy that I met who, was a, who worked at Sellafield. Right. So clearly not an anti-nuclear protester. <laughs> but he said, and he'd worked in uh, nuclear submarines, American guy. Right. And he worked, at, he'd worked on, in one, whatever form of developing nuclear powered submarines. And he just said, do you know how much the nuclear power plant costs in a submarine? And I went, no, expecting him to tell me. Right. <laughs> and he said, no one does. <laughs> Exactly, because it's an incredibly highly kept secret, and yeah. no one's going to tell you how much it costs off the scale, unimaginable amounts of money. Yeah. yeah, but you know, in terms of the technology, proven, really, really safe, really reliable, really powerful. You know, all those things oh, you yeah. can't argue with that. We no. haven't had nuclear submarines blowing up all over the world; they've no. been perfectly safe and serviceable. Yeah, and modern, modern, and to be fair to the modern technologies that they're proposing for small nuclear reactors, they're as safe as well. They've got dropout mechanisms yeah. where it just physically won't work if something goes yeah. wrong. You don't need human intervention. That's the, that's been the problem yes. previously. If something goes wrong, it automatically it melts something like a plug, right. an ice plug, and that right. plug just falls out and everything just and drops through reacting. into a into a into a, uh, a, a vat and it, it stops completely. So yeah. 
So it's good technology. It's it's much better and a much more efficient technology. So it ticks all the boxes. Yeah. Nuclear waste you could you could debate about, um, but yeah. even that you could debate. You know, other you know proponents would debate that the the actual when you look at the actual like that chart we looked at of minerals and iron ore. Yes. When you start comparing the volume of nuclear waste oh, compared scary. to lots of yeah. other things that we dump into yeah. the ground, it's absolutely minuscule. Tiny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but but it, I just don't think it'll. I just don't think the numbers will stack up. When you start yeah. comparing to what what we can talk about now, which is wind and solar, yeah. you start saying that the you know the price of offshore and onshore wind has reduced by I don't know seventy percent in the last seven years, yeah. uh, and, and batteries have come down. I mean, in nineteen ninety, you're paying nine thousand pounds, nine thousand dollars for a hundred watt hour. Yeah, um, per amazing. kilogram, yeah. and now you're paying fifty quid for five hundred watt hour per, kilo, yeah. uh, per kilogram. So you know the prices are just dropping like a stone for renewable energy, yeah. and so those economies of scale are the ones that people are that, that are working, and yeah. therefore investors are investing in. They're taking the course of least resistance, and it'll be wind and solar with yeah. with battery energy storage, and, yes. and the market will decide. And that's how it's working now. You know the, the national grid is saying it wants fifty gigawatts. I think of just of offshore wind by twenty thirty. Right. We're at, we're at about 12 now yeah um, I think so, so bit, there's maybe a, a bit more on that yeah. maybe a bit more yeah, yeah maybe 15 it's going up, yeah. it's going up very very quickly uh, yeah. current current uk demand is about 100 i think 100 gigawatts something like that, of electricity capacity anyway yes um, uh I don't, well it, is it that much i thought it was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I must mm. trust you dave because i know you're the best. well but, i mean when I'm i look sure at I... it it's, it's between sort of 40 and 70 is what i'm seeing on the from the national grid but uh, it's so yeah yeah I'm, i don't i'm sure well, that I, isn't right I, I, I might have got that wrong. I'm, I'm completely fallible, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers will immediately be writing comments in the, <laughs> right now. Don't you know. <laughs> don't you know. It's so 10,000 <laughs> yeah. petawatts a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, okay. It's but a lot I mean, anyway. what the, the idea is that we would install more more generating capacity than we would ever consume at any one time. I think that's the sort of... That's the, the general idea in terms yeah. of getting to 100% renewable. I'm reading this... Just this book here, which is by Mark Jacobson. Have you interviewed Mark Jacobson? Yes, yes, I, yes, yeah, I, I thought I've got had. the book up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that is that basically explains exactly what people yeah. need to know. Um, I'm also reading, <laughs> for the slightly more nerdy, I'm reading that as well, which is, that's quite dense. Oh, my God. I wouldn't that necessarily is... recommend that, Robert. It's like, <laughs> oh, God. And then the discount rate of 0.2% is compared to a discount rate of 1.5%. And you will see that there's a 20 fold difference in 2075. <laughs> oh, God, my brain's exploding. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, but okay. it's. Because I've just got to, t I've got to show you this one. That I, I met the author at the show. I don't know if you've heard, you know, about this. This is extraordinary. And I barely started reading it. Who's written that? It, this is Yasmin Ali, who worked Ooh. in oil and gas and then went, hmm. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> so it's an engineer's adventure into sustainable energy. So it's oh, a very wow. different take. And I have I've read like the her life story effectively. So which is fascinating. So we're gonna she's coming on the podcast at some point. Yeah. But I want to read want to read it first because it's the amount of times I've now interviewed people about their books and I've struggled and got halfway through. Yeah. So yeah. like Hannah mean. Ritchie, I'd have I I've nearly <laughs> finished her book now. Yeah, I saw that podcast. I saw your interview with her on the on stage. <laughs> well, I, I had might, fallen asleep. I, I might have fallen. <laughs> but I told I told her that in in you know I was trying to be you know in whatever not what's it called in not in secrecy you know but not expecting yeah. her to repeat it for full disclosure sort of thing. Yeah, full exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, look, I should I, ask, I should have asked her to sign an NDA before I told her. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. But, but yes, but you're right. The point is we will build out, we're building out loads more. There's, there's, I think there's 18 new wind, uh, offshore wind. We've all got loads. I've just done a video on this, yeah. actually. And when you look at the map, it's, you know, it's very, very it's good, phenomenal. our offshore yeah. wind. It's, it's world beating. And we're and there's 18 more coming online that they're right. building this this fantastic offshore grid with HV, you know, high voltage yeah. um, direct current interconnectors. And, and instead of, so nine of those new 18 uh, offshore developments will be, We'll have something called a coordinated connection instead of a radial connection. So instead of each developer just shoving a cable from their farm right. back to land and going, use our use our electrons, yeah. not theirs, they've convinced them that they they'd be much better off. It'd be cheaper in the long run to connect up and play nicely together, which is right. rare in commerce. But yeah. so it costs a bit more. It's something like seven point six billion to do it in a coordinated way. But it, um, but in, but you save about thirteen billion over the 40 year period of the lifespan of the right. farms because the national grid doesn't have to do so much curtailing to try and balance everything up. Right. So switch, switching off wind turbines up in North and turning Which them on crazy, the South, yeah. you lose yeah. a bunch of money when you do that. Yeah. And that's because everyone's 
playing by themselves and not playing right. as a team. If you start coordinating all the wind farms and all the developers, that all all those electrons work in sync, and you have to do right. much less curtailment. And over the so it actually over the long run, it's five billion quid better for the right. consumer, like you and me. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's all happening. Onshore, you know, Friends of the Earth have just released a, a, a brilliant study by Exeter University, which I'm doing yes. a video on this week, just yesterday. Oh, oh good. You're good. I'm glad um, you're doing yeah. that. Yeah. And actually, as part of that, I interviewed, uh, I spoke to Sarah Merrick at Ripple Energy, and right. um, and she uh, put me on to uh, Simon, her chief operations um, right. uh, p- person, officer is the word, isn't it? Yeah. Um, chief project officer, officer, actually. And I spoke to him yesterday via Zoom. He's going to be on the video talking about how Ripple, you know, their cooperative Right, um, which is such a model. brilliant idea. Oh, isn't it? Fantastic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and Sarah was on one of the panels that I hosted. At, yeah. at, uh, at, so I, and that was the first time I really sort of engaged my brain and had to think about it properly. And, and when you think about it, it's just a brilliant idea. So when I the, mean, we should quickly explain just for people who won't know it, because certainly overseas people won't know about Ripple. What do you want to explain what what the idea is with their, yeah. with their system? So they they get a cooperative. They set up a cooperative society um, of of homeowners and small businesses. Those homeowners and small businesses chuck in a bit of money, and that gives them a pot of money. They then buy. They go and do due diligence on on prospective wind and solar farms that have not that have been permitted. So they're all good to go, but they haven't yeah. yet been constructed. Ripple Energy pay for the construction, so that's their wind farm or their solar yeah. park, and then all those contributions from homeowners and small businesses. They give them a share. Of when that when that starts con- uh, generating power, each person gets a share of that power. So that yeah. when the you've got this balancing this sort of this sort of balancing mechanism, when the wholesale prices go up, if you're just a consumer like normal people, when yeah. the wholesale prices go up, your bill goes up. Yeah. But if you're a generator as well, you've got a share in a solar park. Then when the wholesale prices go up, your bill does go up, but so do your savings. So do your savings, yeah. So you've got that you've got that sort of um, stability mechanism. Because I mean, the way you get your dividend, if you like, is is actually a reduction in your electricity bill. Correct. It? Which is such a clever way of doing it. So you yeah. you don't have to you don't get a check that you then got to cash and then pay your electricity bill. It no. just reduces your electricity. Exactly. Bill. Fantastic. And, and so if we can, you know, and the, the, the Exeter University report for the Friends of the Earth was saying basically they've they've identified. 2.9% of England, they only did it in England, of land that isn't, it's not areas of outstanding natural beauty. It's yeah. not anywhere near grade one or two listed buildings. It's it's not, you know, it's not on land that's used for anything else. They've even discounted agrivoltaics. They've discounted rooftop solar. They've discounted solar on car parks. They've just looked at basically right. areas that aren't doing anything at all. Brownfield, horrible sites where they could play. And it's 3% or nearly 3% of the country. Now, obviously, they're not suggesting we'd use all of that. No. Because that would be that would generate two point five times the total amount of electricity being demanded by UK homes today. So, that, you know, that is so. When you hear that, you just go, "Oh, I see. It's that yeah. way round." Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. So you don't need all we that. Just generate we, way too much power. That, we would generate way too much. We'd store loads of it in batteries, big battery yeah. energy storage. Um, we might use some of it for for making hydrogen for for reducing iron, maybe if you want to do that. But but basically, you'd store it and. and and the way the numbers stack up, according to the people like Mark Jacobson and others, even in the what the Germans call the Dunkelflaute, you know, the horrible yes. manky days in winter where you've got you know, dreary weather, it's not dreary for seven days in a row with no. absolutely zero sunshine. There is sunshine somewhere during yeah. those times, and if you've got this, you've got the amount of solar and wind that's geared for that that worst case scenario. And the and by the way, the national grid also gears themselves for that worst case scenario. Yeah. They're, al- they're already set up for worst case scenario for obvious reasons. Then you'll get yourself through winter with maybe two or three days worth maximum of energy storage. You don't right. need, m- people say, oh, you need three months of energy storage yeah, to get yourself through winter. So oh, yeah. a nonsense. Yeah. Maybe two or three yeah. days. When you're not in winter and you've got lots of sunshine and all this wind and solar is generating absolutely oodles of energy yeah. that you, you, you're struggling to know what to do with, you can put it into all sorts of things that fossil fuels currently fuel today. Um, yeah. Uh, desalination of water for example in in countries that need it and and yeah. you know there's all sorts of things that you could use it for so so that's the idea and that's where yeah. people like mark jacobson and others say you know you can get to 100 percent renewable um renewable structure and i can't help uh mentioning i think they do mention it in that report the fact that there are already today far greater areas covered by golf courses in the uk <laughs> It's it's yeah it's nearly in places like they said in Merseyside the West Midlands and Surrey it's three percent 
of the land is, is golf courses. <laughs> and, and, and the average for the whole country is 2%. So, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, you know, it's a popular sport and people love playing it. And I don't want to stop them. But, you know, I yeah. think it's worth putting it. That kind of does put it in context. It does. Because they don't, they're not growing a lot of carrots and potatoes on golf courses as a general rule. You are right, Robert. And, and if you have actions. sheep on them, doesn't that get in the way? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Sheep at their own risk. Yeah. Yeah. That is, but, yeah. but that is, I mean, what is in, fascinating with this is that, you know, particularly because I've just been in Australia and when you see the kind of levels of solar installation there and the impact that has. So there's this bonkers town. I'm going to go back there next year. And I've now finally got contact with them. Yakandanda in, in country Victoria. Very right. small town. I don't know what it would be. Maybe two or three thousand people at the most. But they're going for it's TR, uh, try, uh, totally renewable Yakandanda is the, <laughs> is the kind of, uh, you know, volunteer committee that are running it. And they, they are very, they're very, they're constantly a hundred percent like wow. all over the year, but there's days that they're not. And so they're trying to get to that final bit where they are a hundred percent powered by their own stuff. So they've got solar farms, they've got solar on the roofs, they've got batteries, they've got all that. But what the thing that shocked me, which then gives you a clue as to, the economics of this stuff is that in that case, I've used their rapid charger, just right. a 50 kilowatt rapid charger. Well, I wasn't planning to, I didn't know they had one. So I drove to the place, which wasn't, you know, maybe uh, 60, 70 K from where we were drove there. And, uh, wow, well, there's a charger in the car park. Oh my goodness. Oh, plug it in, go. Can I use it? Oh God, it's really easy. I had yeah. the right app. It, okay. Anyway, it worked. It actually delivered 50 kilowatts, which they very rarely do. And it costs 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. 20 Australian cents, which at the current exchange rate is about 10p yeah. a kilowatt hour for a rapid charger, not, a, not a, just a plug in the wall. Amazing. And I just couldn't believe it. And then from the little bit of information I got on the day, they've got a multi megawatt hour battery system in the town. I don't know what size. I mean, that's what I've got to find out in, in future. And then huge amount of solar. Basically, their power is free. And so they're right. charging 20 cents. They're raking it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much profit do you make on this? Well, oh, about 20 cents a kilowatt yeah. hour. It's not bad. <laughs> zero I, gave them, I think I gave them $1.20 and that was pure profit, you know. So, <laughs> but, you know, that is, then you go, well, that's, that's them and it's a community thing. It's not a big commercial operation and it's not all those things. And I think they've got some government subsidies and they will have probably support from the company that put the charger in you know all that but yeah. the bottom line is their power is cheaper than anyone else's yeah and that all the people in the town and it crosses because there are they're not all uh tree hugging hippies in yakindan there's some i think it's i'm going to be diplomatic but there's some people <laughs> who might not be like that there i okay. saw one or two of them yeah but, but the they're getting this... really cheap electricity and they're very happy with that and the subsidy and this is another point that, that, that you know guys more knowledgeable than me have made uh, subsidy for renewables um, is not going to be there forever because no. the economy of scale for renewables is the, the, the S curve is clear. You yeah. know, you know, you're going to get to a point where the economies of scale say you won't need subsidies because it, on, in its own right, it will be so cheap. Yeah. And that's the difference. Going back to the nuclear argument, that's another one yes. of the arguments for nuclear. Nuclear is not on an S curve. It's on a flat, it's on a flat lining. It can't be made any more yeah efficient than it already is so subsidizing yeah. that is 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 a fool's errand because you're not you're not getting it anywhere you're never going to stop subsidizing it because it's never going to get any better whereas people that say oh you're all stuff it's only good because you're subsidizing renewables well it, it, all, all you know shut up all, all all new technologies need a bit of an oomph at the start yeah. like you know every technology that's ever existed has needed a bit of oomph from somewhere yeah. to get them going but the good ones after they've got economy of scale, they then survive on their own right. Yeah. And that's exactly what will happen with Except with the fossil fuel industry, who Ex still get huge subsidies. Yeah, yeah. because again, per same argument. The, the internal yeah. combustion engines had 120-odd, 140-odd years to get really, really good. It's not going to yeah. get any better than it is. No. It's finished. It's finished It's finished years and years ago, really, getting yeah. as good as it. It's about 25%, maybe 30, if you're lucky, percent efficient. Yeah. And that is it, because physics, as as physics it say that's as good as it gets. So, Isn't that... I I do think that's extraordinary. And I, that that moment was a real game changer for me. I was in Germany, test driving the Honda Clarity uh, hydrogen fuel cell car, oh, yeah. which was amazing. You know, no question about it. I was with Quentin Wilson, and we both drove one of these cars. And when we were in their workshop, this is Honda. They had a, a this beautifully. It was lovely. It was like a museum exhibit. It was a three cylinder 
a, a petrol engine on a bench and they were running it and it was really quiet and it had an exhaust pipe that went up a big extractor fan through yeah. the roof and it was it was like this lovely little purr and they were so proud of it because it was 33 percent efficient <laughs> right and they were really they were and i went and I'd never thought about it. It mm. never occurred. You know, from my dad's lawnmower engine that we put on a go-kart back in the 1960s yeah. to that moment, I never, never thought about the efficiency of a combustion engine. I didn't even know what it would mean. Mm. And then you go, wait a minute, 33%? What? So what happens to the other, you know, the yeah. rest of it? Now, well, that's heat and friction and, you know, yeah. all, the, all the stuff to make it work, the cooling. And, and, that, and that is brilliant. No engines are 33% efficient. I mean, no. there's no engines in a car that are that efficient. This was just a, a test bed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you say. And I mean, that stuff, when you tell people that, which I like to do constantly, you put a quid in your car and about 25 pence moves you along the road. The 75 pence is utterly wasted. Absolutely. You may as well just pour that petrol down a drain. You know? I mean, the, the analogy, you can use the analogy of the incandescent bulb and the LED light bulb. When they yeah. came in, everyone was like, oh, LEDs, they're rubbish. I'm going to stick with my... But, you know, yeah. an, an incandescent bulb is extremely good at generating heat, just like an yes. internal combustion engine. Most, 95% of what an incandescent bulb does is generate heat, heat, which is why you can't yeah. touch them. And only yeah. about 5% of it comes out as light. Whereas an LED bulb, 95% of it is light. Yeah. And less than five percent is is heat. So it's yeah. completely the yeah. inverse. Um, so these, um, but people, but as you say, you make a good point. The average Joe in the street doesn't think about that. When they're not, we're not told. We're not really educated about that at school. No, unless you, no. unless you unless you really choose to go into engineering, you don't yeah. learn about that in, in your own. Well, I was going to say O levels, GCSEs, aren't they? Yeah, it's aging me a bit. Um, so we don't know that sort of stuff. And of course, yeah. it's not volunteered by the powers that be because no. the incumbents, because it's not in their interests to. To you know, to, to own up to that rubbish. Sort of then, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we are crap. But if you yeah. if you could carry on see, bearing with us, <laughs> I want to see the the car advert. You know, with the young woman driving along the beautiful road in Italy with no <laughs> other cars on it, as is always in every car. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they go, our technology <laughs> utilizes twenty six point two percent of the fuel you put in it to create motion. We're <laughs> roaring ahead. Shell, we're <laughs> shit. <laughs> God, it's a battle, isn't it? It's so tedious. And still, you know, every day I will get some just really difficult. I've yeah. decided to be really, really polite and kind and patient. But every now and then a slightly spiky comment leaks out. And I know I shouldn't. It doesn't help. Well, it's but, hard you know, not to get... because it, it's such a con- – I was looking at a, a – I'll read it out in a minute. We'll get to it. But, a, you know, just looking at a report earlier a, a, about – you know, European EV sales and things like that. And, and yeah. you know, with it three three paragraphs into its own headline, it contradicts its own headline in the same article. It, yes, but they, they're, relying on the, yeah. they're relying on the fact that most people will only read the headline, presumably, and, and that gets yeah. them a click yeah. and then and probably won't read down to where someone actually tells, tells you the real truth, which is completely yeah. different to the headline. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. I mean, you, well, you guys and, and Quentin yeah, do well, more God, of it than I do. It all, but there's a great one out today, which has actually come through. I didn't see it. It's come through the, um, the Stop Burning Stuff group, which is about WLTP, you know, because we're always hearing about this with cars and you go, look, the WLTP on my Nissan Leaf is 11,000 miles, but the actual range <laughs> is 63. And we're all used to that. And that's normal. You know, whatever the bloody hell it says, you know, it is nowhere near that. Well, then you see the advert that says 60 miles per gallon, WLTP. Nowhere near. There's been research done in Europe that has proven that this is utter nonsense. It's just yeah. as bad. I mean, WLTP should be taken out the back door. It should, and yeah. Gently... <laughs> <laughs> put out of its misery yeah yeah because yeah. it's utter utter nonsense i mean it is mm. anyway but i mean it, it's so refreshing to see that apply to fuel burning vehicles rather than electric cars because i always yeah. think yeah damn down tp it's not real <laughs> we both do the same yeah. thing <laughs> we've obviously <laughs> met the same guy and i've heard that wltp isn't reliable <laughs> for electric car. Yeah, it's not reliable for petrol ones. Oh, uh, uh, my, my car does 98 miles to the gallon yeah, right. pulling up hill with a with a five-ton trailer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or whatever we shouldn't be cruel no no indeed very naughty but uh no but that uh, now the next that other story that we and i don't know whether we can how far we can go but there was one or two interesting things about that the about the battery the, the sub stack um thing about oh, yeah. batteries yeah. by dean walter sam butler sloss sam butler sloss i know that name i'm sure i, I do too anyway. and i don't know why no but Sorry, Kingsmill Sam, Bond, watching. I don't know Kingsmill Bond, but what a cool name! Yeah, the name's the name's Bond, Kingsmill Bond. It's quite. But anyway, the, sounds like the a share battery... offer for a bread maker. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> but one of the things that they've come out here is the battery domino effect, which I think is really interesting. It's the third bit on that doc on that document. Um, so you know when and it's where you create a cheaper battery and that then creates a new use for it. It's not just yeah. that you're you're you've got a cheaper battery. You've actually got a different use for it and it comes out in a different place and it's used right. in a different way. And that then reduces the cost. You know, it's those yeah. things that we've we've seen on a massive scale. And it does because I for a long time I was sort of obsessed with kind of grid storage technologies that weren't lithium ion. Okay. Because it just seemed to be that can't be right. I, remember I saw one of the very first big Tesla power packs being put in in California. Yes, and I saw them arriving on a truck with big cranes that were lifting off these boxes, and they opened up one of the things. We, it was filming for this is for the BBC. It wasn't for fully charged, and this was like a four megawatt hour installation next to a pika plant in California, and they could replace the pika plant. Blah blah blah. All that that story, which was great, but then you they'd open up one of the racks, and that is full of. 6,943 cells, you yeah. know, individual cells on that rack, and there's 400 of them in this box, and that weighs 17 tons, and da 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 da. And you go, that can't be. It just sort of went, that does seem it instinctively wrong. feels like the wrong, wrong, yeah, I know, yeah. I know what you mean. And then there's the company that a friend of mine is one of the investors in in, um, in Australia called Red Flow, which is vanadium yeah. flow batteries. Which, just, when you see that, you go, well, that's clever because also they benefit from being charged to 100% and drained to, to zero. Yes. Indeed. They actually improve. You, you do that on purpose. You drain it right out so there's nothing in it, and that cleans it off, and then you charge it again. And they can be charged and discharged, like, I don't know how many times, but it's tens of thousands. It's almost so there's ne negligible um, yeah. degradation in that because you're just running yeah. a fluid through and, and reacting the fluid and flushing it out, as you say, and then yeah. running it back through again, and it's almost not um, it's not infinite, but, it, but it's no, very, but very, very, very it's, low. It's indeed. the little pumps that are the thing that you have to replace sometimes yes. that pump the fluid. But, and that was the other one was that someone asked them when I was there, Oh, what about the fire problem with the batteries? They might catch fire. And he went, well, it's full of 16 gallons of fire, flame retardant. Please set fire to it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, best of luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're made for stationary energy storage, of course. Yes, um, wouldn't they be? No, uh, you couldn't use it in a car or something. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're a put, they are a good solution and they're very cheap. Yeah. Um, and they're yes. very scalable because if you want to, if you want to scale up a, re a redox flow battery, you just, you just make your your containers of fluid bigger. Yeah. Whereas if you want to scale up lithium ion installations, you have to just buy twice as many lithium ion batteries, a yeah. whole shooting match with the battery management system and the whole thing. You can't just, you know, plug some more cells into a yeah. configuration. You have to go and buy the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. So it's much, much cheaper to scale up redox batteries. And I think that right. that is being thought about, obviously it's in Australia, as you say, yeah. I think over here, um, the grid's looking at that very seriously. Right. Not sure about America. Don't know whether they've no, got on board know. with that yet. But, I mean, it does seem because there was a big battery uh, in Cowley, which is just on the edge of Oxford, which I went to see. And stupidly, we didn't film it, which is I went to the opening of it. And that is, a, I think it's two thirds lithium ion and one third flow batteries. Right. Which is kind of an experiment, but it's a big experiment. It's not like a little one in the corner. It's mass. I mean, you walk through these huge constructions and it's, yeah. that's a big flow battery and it is megawatt hours of storage there. But I don't know. That was a few years ago. So I don't know how that's. It would be great to catch up with them as go. Is this which one's work? Which one's better? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're oh, kind oh. of slightly different, but they're all working together. So there's this huge charging hub now in a, uh, an, a car park in on the edge of Oxford, and that's powered from those batteries because it's right. such a huge demand. So they ran. Yeah. It's not that far. In, it's probably two miles away. So they've run a, a specific cable to that site so it can charge. I yeah. Know, there's there's a lot of it's. Um, Fastnet and Tesla have a huge amount of okay. rapid chargers there. And, and actually, the point you make about which one's better, it's that, that what, the, what the operators are saying is, well, we're not necessarily pitting one against the other. We're actually finding yeah. that the more the merrier yeah. because they each have their own benefits and, 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 yeah. and drawbacks, and, and not least of which is, is instant response, for example. So lithium ion is very good, as you know, is balancing yeah. grids and frequency response and all that sort of stuff because it's instant. Yeah. And it's probably the, its economies of scale suggest that after you get about past about four or maybe six hours, it starts to get quite expensive to keep discharging right. lithium-ion batteries for long duration, like twelve hours. It's just it just happens to be expensive to do it that way. It's better for the short response stuff, and then other right. technologies 
like um like redox flow, flow is a bit yeah. lot longer and maybe a bit of compressed air perhaps this liquid air yeah. battery that they talk yeah. about and obviously pumped hydro is your your, your acme yes, of you know one. that yeah. 160 gigawatts of pumped hydro in the world at the moment but you do yeah. need you do need a mountain you kind of need and a couple of reservoirs and that is slightly limiting <laughs> yeah you need well that's what's and it's so unfair uh, when you go to norway and yes. you realize oh there's only five million of them and there's seven million mountains <laughs> That's more than and one. Eight each. million, That's eight million greedy. lakes that are really high. So they've got amazing <laughs> pump storage. Yeah. it's just yeah. unfair. It's not. Yeah, yeah, they're very well advantaged, and they get rain. You know, so they get, yeah, they get melting snow and rain. Yeah, yeah. which is yeah. Oh. Uh, yes. um, uh, the there was a one. Oh, damn, I had a thing about. I had a thought. <laughs> The, should... When I was younger, I used to get a log jam, which was like nine ideas all kind of coming oh, yeah. in at once, and I couldn't yeah. talk. Now I look at the river; there's nothing in it. <laughs> there's no logs; <laughs> just gone blank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I know the feeling, Robert. I really do. There was a lot. I think there was a twig that floated past. That was a notion. Right. It's just, now it's now gone over the waterfall. So nothing. Something to do with batteries. Battery storage. It's going to be something to do with batteries. Yeah, energy storage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, well, uh, no. Lithium uh, ion, sodium ion, solid lithium. state. Oh God. Oh yes. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> I love all that. So that's. I feel that's kind of left us, and I'm hoping it's going to come back, um, like Volta trucks. <laughs> Just very oh, yeah. quickly, I saw a Volta truck at Millbrook Proving Ground the other day and went, oh, Volta trucks, that was brilliant, and they went bankrupt. No, oh. they've, they've relaunched oh. big oh. time with massive amount of money behind them. Oh, fantastic, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, they're being built in Germany, they've got huge funding, they're, they're, they're going off again. Yeah, we might see Volta trucks yet. Okay. Anyway, but a bit like, I remember talking to a lovely, slightly bonkers professor, I think it somewhere in, uh, uh, like it wasn't Exeter, but it was a coastal university, that I met at a conference who was doing underwater balloons. Southampton? In, I think it might have been Southampton, yeah. yeah. Where they blow up a big balloon with a massive concrete base. Like, you know, I'm saying balloon, I mean a, a an inflatable device. Right. And that's pump that they use excess renewable energy to pump air into that. Right. And okay. of course, it's naturally under pressure because it's underwater. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you need that power, you, you let it out and it right, drives a turbine, spins a generator. And it just went, wow, it's brilliant. But there was other people there go, you know, you do need a concrete block that weighs like 4.2 million tons yeah. to hold it down. <laughs> hold it said, down Try yeah. pushing, a, pushing a big, you know, inflated ball underwater in a swimming pool. Yeah, it's not easy. It's really difficult. Yeah. So there's always but, the downside, but but it's good. I mean, all these the, the thing. I think the thing about it, and I say this so many times. While I said it, at everything electric as well. While the world is squabbling about the whys and wherefores of climate yeah. change, and even whether it's real over in America and what have you, scientists and engineers all over the world are just quietly getting on with fixing yeah. the bloody problem, or at least coming yeah. up with technologies that are going to help us fix the problem anyway. And, yeah. and you know, and and the more the merrier. And, and we're finding. The other main point that that strikes that comes out to me is that before before all this happened, before we knew we were destroying our own atmosphere with with, yes. with carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels, we were so profligate because it was come it was gushing out of the ground like yeah. like it was never going to it, it was never going to yeah. it was like an infinite resource and we were unbelievably wasteful. You know, yeah. people were having the central heating on full with all the windows open. Well, I like a breeze, but you got, yeah. you got the central heating on. Yeah, but it, yeah. it's a bit stuffy. Well, t- t- you know, but you could when it was. You know, yeah. had been threepence halfpenny a bloody megawatt yeah. hour or something ridiculous yeah. back in 1973 before the oil crisis, whatever. Yeah. And we've 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 still got all over the world, well, all over in the Western world where we've got used to you know um, wasting fossil fuels. We've got this mindset that we are, we're allowed we we're entitled to be as stupid and profligate as we want to be yes. because someone's always going to keep us in cotton wool. And all I've got to do is press yeah. that button on the wall, and my light will come on, and and yeah. my bills will be cheap. Now, of course, now. Bills aren't so cheap, and people are starting to realise they need to be more, bit more careful with energy. And that mindset, uh, and 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 more and more careful about the way we we derive energy and the way we store it. And that's what engineers yeah. and scientists are getting very good at doing. We're, we're starting to winkle pick the clever stuff out that we never had to bother with before because it wasn't yeah. necessary. Now we are, and goodness me, aren't scientists coming up with some clever ideas? Not all yeah. of them are working. Some of them are no. completely bonkers, of course, and they're quite good fun to read as well. But yeah. but a lot of them are going to work, and a combination of them of a combination of them is what the grid operators are saying. That's fine. It's, Give us lots of combinations, then we can yeah. slot them into all the gaps in our matrix, our, our time yeah. and, and energy matrix, and it'll fill everything up. And then we can use our clever AI 
algorithms which now exist to, to coordinate yeah. all that. We'll have lots of offshore wind. We'll have lots of onshore wind, solar, everything, battery energy storage, lovely. Jobs are good. Yeah. And, and all of that will, will, will work. And, and in, you know, in 10 years' time, we will, we will be very close to being there. Yeah. In yeah. this country, no, I anyway. I think you're right. I absolutely think you're right. But what, um, one of the glitches, so I've just remembered a log floating down my consciousness <laughs> river. Not I'm a not very big log. You need to use the, the, the phrase log because when you, I've just remembered a log I was thinking about earlier. And that's, that's a, it's an unfortunate turn of phrase, it's, Robert. If you it don't can know. be. It's a, it's certain, uh, yes, it's certain colloquialisms. Uh, the sawn off tree. Oh, but is that a waste of wood? No, it's going to go and be made into something useful. Um, uh, no, the, I went to this. Uh, I think I may have mentioned it to you when we met for 14 seconds. Uh, the Aurora <laughs> Energy Conference in Oxford, which is an amazing event. And yeah. I was so lucky. Because it's, I couldn't afford to attend as a proper person. But, you know, it's like too expensive. But I was a speak. I did a little speech at the end of it. But the one of two of the panels I heard discussed, and this is a, a an increasingly clearly frustrating theme for a lot of people in renewable energy. So, Oct uh, Greg Jackson from Octopus Energy oh. in the UK was sort of fuming about it. Um, yeah. They have a solar farm planning permission. The technology, the massive battery the land, the support from the local community in this area outside York somewhere, that's all there. They've got right. the funding coming through the, out of their ears. There's just so much funding. They, they, what they've got to wait till 2038 is for a, a grid connection. You and can't so believe there is, it, can you? And this was the frustration I heard from people who are doing offshore wind as well, <clears throat> is, is getting the kind of level, because the grid connection, for, as you've been discussing, for multiple offshore wind farms, is not small. No, it's not an extension cable out your shed. <laughs> you got, can you? Do you know where you put the extension, on, Sheila? I, I need to plug it in because I've got off your wind coming. <laughs> yeah, it's quite. Yeah. I think it's quite a fat wire, indeed. And that means uh, infrastructure on the coast, and it means that's then there's yeah. people who uh, want my lovely agent, my theatrical agent, has a house uh, on the Suffolk coast, and they want to build a big. Uh, you know, offshore wind thing. And I, and she was going, well, we don't want that sort of thing. I said, how far are you from Sizewell B? Yeah. Two miles. That's quite a big installation. Yeah. But they're used to that because that's been there. That was there mm. before she bought the house. You know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, but it's, I can understand, you know, that if you're suddenly going to have a big industrial site near your lovely coastal home. Well, that's, but that's the, I suppose that that's, a, that's the problem with perception, isn't it? Because yeah. it was interesting what Simon um, was saying from Ripple Energy because I said to him, "Oh, well, presumably you're getting your you're getting these things already permitted, so you haven't got to go." I actually said the word, "You haven't got to go through the pain of getting yeah. consent." He said, "Well, it's interesting you say the pain. When we did our first wind turbine in in, in Wales, yeah, I was there let, when they put it up. It's great. Yeah, okay, actually, so yeah. so the, so the permitting process for that letters of complaint zero, literally right. zero complaints because there were turbines already around in other areas yeah. of Wales. The people in Wales, at least, uh, they know they're moving from a coal mining yeah. industry." to a green energy industry and they are embracing it and they they just they are used to living with wind turbines and these objects the main two objections he raised were you know they kill birds yeah. well he said well if you're really concerned about birds the biggest threat to birds is climate change so if you want to do something for yeah. birds you need to be doing something about climate change and this idea about them being noisy he said so i i take people to wind farms yeah and then when they get there they go i thought you said why am I being told it's noisy? Yes, it's noisy. It's not it? noisy. You have to, if you stand right underneath one, you can you can yeah, hear it. But, just okay, about. but there's a, a kilometre before, you know, the, the oh, exclusion is only a kilometre but around all, all new yeah. developments. I mean, that's a long way away. So, so yeah, but it, it's, right. he said it's just about you, you show people the empirical evidence rather than the hysterical yes, evidence. Yes, yes. And, yeah. and then people, re but they have to see it, they have to experience it for themselves before they, believe it and i can understand that as well in this day and age you don't know what to yeah. bloody believe these days because no. you know depending on what you read you get completely diametrically opposed to Absolutely. views about something and i mean so you that have to... stuff as well also goes in it kind of goes in waves so i remember all i heard for weeks was oh birds being murdered by <laughs> things and it was you know, trump said it as well so that oh, yeah. kind of gave it extra thing and then you go you look at the statistics i mean you know and you don't want to say it because the british love cats but cats number one by a billion country mile in slaughtering billions of birds. I mean, absolute brutal, brutal slaughter. And yeah. the next one is glass-fronted buildings. Yes. The birds fly into those all the time. I shouldn't and, laugh. That's not, it's not funny. No, I mean, it's but not it's, funny. And, yeah. it, and, and uh, wind turbines are way, way down. I mean, and climate change and air pollution 
Yeah. Get, have a, a, a beautiful a bird of prey fly through the, the smokestack coming out of a coal burning power yeah. plant. Yeah. It's, even if it doesn't die then, it's going to die pretty soon after. Yeah, and absolutely. That, and, and buggering up all the migratory patterns. I mean, there's just, you yeah. know, species like that are under great, great yeah. threat. And, and, and so, you know, yeah, the odd work wind turbine is, is no, by it's, comparison, it's, it's minuscule, really. So I mean, do, you, do you feel this? Because I feel like it, they, they, I was thinking about it the other day when uh, I was walking along a country lane here. So it's very quiet, bird song, And I heard, which was a car coming behind me. And I stepped to one side. It was a narrow lane. And it was an electric car. I heard it miles behind me yeah electric cars tires make a lot of noise and it was yeah. people i knew and they waved and off they went and then a, a diesel van went past and i heard that too yeah you know people for week, months years oh i don't want people electric cars they'll run me over because i won't hear them coming <laughs> which is so hyper ignorant because yeah. that does mean you've got to have a psychopathic driver who wants to kill you driving down the lane Absolutely. sees a human being goes i can get them yeah <laughs> Uh, it's just uh, I, those I, change. I, I mean, those stories change over time. That's of course the, they do because the point people yeah. are fed the, the next the next piece of yeah. spurious nonsense to object to it. I, I often use this analogy. I'll very quickly tell you this analogy. I've used it a few times. But if as a parent, I'm not a parent, but I've got three nephews, so I kind of know the game. And you're a parent, so you know this. But imagine you've got a you know a, a, a callow youth that's in his he's asleep in his bed at seven o'clock in the morning. And as a parent, you know you've got to get that youth from there yeah. to I've his playground there. with all his mates. And when he's in his playground with all his mates, you know he's going to be quite happy because all his mates yeah. are there but getting him from a to b is a bloody pain in the ass because oh i really hate you i don't want to get out I'm cl- comb your hair i don't want to comb your hair eat your breakfast i don't want to have breakfast you know <laughs> and it's whinge every whinge 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 i don't want to do this don't want to do that you're really fascist i don't really hate you but you know are you, sure, well. are you sure you weren't in our kitchen about years ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah in many kitchens i'm sure up and down the land robert yeah. are going yes oh, that God. is true yeah. dave but you know, as a parent, and I'm not being patronising to the great British public, I, I, I'm, you know, I understand the concerns, but, yeah. but the, I'm not saying the British public are like petulant youth. I'm saying they're being fed information yes. by the incumbents to make them act a bit that way. Yeah. But you, you know, the, we know we're going to get the the, 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 the the energy transition is unstoppable. You know that, yeah. I know that, yeah. most people know that. Every, there's not a single automotive manufacturer in the world. If we just take AVs as an example, that's developing an internal combustion engine platform for any new vehicle in, the, in their range. Not a yeah, single one. Yeah, They've no. all retooled to electric vehicles. They ain't going back. No. So we're getting there. We're going to be there. So, yeah. and once we're all there, even the laggards, they might take yeah. them 15 years to get there, a long time after the rest of us, but even they will be driving electric vehicles. And they'll yeah. be like, they'll be the ones that are going, oh, yeah, well, of course, I always said electric vehicles were the yes. way to go. <laughs> And we'll all quietly and patiently go, yes, you did, didn't you, Brian? You are a brilliant genius. Because, <laughs> I mean, there's a, well, that's one of the other stories, which is a classic example of this, which was, you know, rapidly reported in, in the United States about Tesla charging stations not working at minus 20 degrees yes, in yeah. the Midwest or whatever it was when there was a cold thing and, and the wires freezing up. I mean, they didn't mention the fact that all the gas stations had closed down because, <laughs> because all their pumps had broken and there was no yeah. power and they etc. But there's this great report. It's just, it was in an inside. So I'll put all the links to all these things in the show notes, but it's just inside EVs report. It's, it's here's why Norway hasn't had trouble with winter EV charging. Cause that's, you know, the one country with the most electric cars yeah. in the world yeah. is Norway. And it's, I've been there one winter. It's just, chilly. I didn't like it. I thought I could deal with the cold. It's oh, you're pretty frozen. chilly. No, I think it was minus 38. Oh God. <sighs> And I think I'm, I don't want to be a boring old git that tells the same stories. I hadn't told you this before, but my dad, <laughs> when he was a lad, was in Canada as a RAF pilot, training to be an RAF pilot before he went and did proper war stuff. And he we did a wee off the roof of his Nissan <laughs> hut in the middle of uh, somewhere in the mid Midwest of Canada, in Manitoba or somewhere. I don't know where. Right. And it was you know, very cold. And when he, when the wee, his wee hit the ground, it had frozen. It, it bounced around like little green marbles. Oh That's what God. he told me. And I was just yeah. obsessed with this as a kid. And I just wanted to do it. So when I was in Norway, minus 38, <laughs> with really lovely, patient Norwegian people who got me there, and I had proper winter clothes that they'd given me, I climbed up this thing, did a wee off a, a pile of logs, which is quite okay. dangerous, they told me afterwards, and did a pee off it, which is as high as I could get. And it didn't freeze. Right. It was frozen by the time I got off the logs, but it didn't freeze in the air. And they went, no, it's too warm. <laughs> it has to be minus 40 before your wee will freeze on the way God down. Almighty. So minus we were two 40. degrees too warm. But the fact uh, that they could say it's too warm in that temperature where your nostrils are frozen, you know. Like, yeah. Oh, 
your tears freeze in your eyes. You I get, can imagine. Oh, God, yeah. So it's, it is very cold. And they drive electric cars in those temperatures yeah. and they charge them and yeah. they're fine. Because they've got used to because they've got used to the idea of preconditioning engines, they, they so they know how yeah. to they know how to use their equipment. Yes, <laughs> I'm not talking about the wing. I'm talking about the cars. No. Um, but so, also, yeah, their petrol cars don't freeze up because they plug them into. That's why they've got so many bloody charges. There. They yeah. had to, they had to keep their engines warm, otherwise the, they froze up. And they yeah, didn't work. and that and that was the problem in 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 newer markets that aren't used to that. People were just treating their cars badly, and yeah. expecting to just go out and switch them on and put. Well, you, you know, like any like any instrument or tool, if you if you abuse it, it won't work yeah. as well as it as well as it should. Yeah. And it's, I had an ex girlfriend in Germany, and, and she used to find it absolutely hilarious that um, we all, you know whenever we got half a centimeter of snow on the on the roads in the UK, we'd all be slipping and sliding, and schools would shut, and we'd all tell it's a you know national emergency. And yeah. we're in Germany because we don't we weren't we we're weren't getting much it, snow. Yeah. In Germany, they get snow every year. They put yeah. the winter tires on, and it's not a drama. And they're driving, they're driving, shoveling six feet of snow out of the way because yeah. they, because they, it's what they're used to. That's what to. they do. Yeah. And that's that's part of the, I guess that's part of the the, the challenge is 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 getting used to new technology. Um, but well, also it, I think we're going to have to get used to different weather. I mean that the report, yeah, yeah. The, this report freaked me out because I don't, I actually tend not. We don't talk about climate change a lot on Fully Charged Show. We don't because there's other people doing it better with more knowledge. But right. when you hear about what was happening in Antarctica, so Helen Chersky. Is the it's when you when you hear a proper scientist yeah. that actually does proper science, and she is really worried. She's seen what's happened in the Arctic. The, mm -hmm. the fact that you can now you can have a, a ship that goes to the North Pole. Yeah, you know I don't know. You know you don't need to know a great deal about the world and uh, climate, but the North Pole is like ice, isn't it? It's, isn't it? Ice? I knew it was there isn't land there. I knew it's a sea that's frozen. Yeah. But you can now sail a boat in the summer to the North Pole because there's no ice. Yeah. And there's, like you're at the North Pole in a ship. I don't think it was like Absolutely. that. Even when we were kids, it was ice. No, I mean, there wasn't a, the, 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 northern, the northern shipping route didn't exist. It was an no. aspiration by Russia and, and others in the Arctic Circle that, that yeah. you know, maybe one day that would be nice. And, and now it, it is, they're all no, is fighting for the bragging rights because they want to own the, the northern shipping route because yeah. the sea ice is disappearing and, and it's now navigable. So that, the, that, that's a very tangible change. Yeah, but that report from the British Antarctic Survey, it's About just terrifying Antarctica. how much higher the temperature was there. It was 38 degrees higher than it should be. It, yeah, uh, in one, yeah, in one part on the uh, East Ar part. Antarctic Plateau. It, uh, so we're getting it's getting a double whammy. The, I mean, we know about the Arctic is, has been getting a, a good yeah. kicking for a long time, and I, I've wobbled on about that in lots and lots of videos, and I've done a bit on Antarctica. But Antarctica, as you say, rather than being... A, a massive sea surrounded by land, which is what Arctic is. It's a massive right. island surrounded by sea, so it's a different, yeah. a different animal. Yeah. And the and and the East Antarctica is is on solid bedrock. Uh, it's actually a mountain range. If you took the the right. ice away, you'd see something like the Alps. So right. It can be very right. very deep. So it's it's really really thick ice. It's pretty solid. Yeah. It was regarded as pretty much impenetrable. Right. And until very very recently indeed, e East Antarctica, the bit that's got the funny sort of the more oblique shapes to it and things, and, yeah. the, and the Pine Island and Swaites Glacier and all that, that's all over on the east. That's that's actually uh, pack ice on, on on a group of islands, and some of right. the ice is actually dipping below water level as it as it packs around these islands. So that's much less um, secure, much more fragile. So that's where we've got right. these glaciers and things. And, and so would get... that be where a big glacier would break off and float around? That, that's the thing. worry the scientists yeah. have got. These two, the Thwaites Glacier, for example, is the size of Great Britain. Just, <laughs> just to give you, and, and if you look at it on the map of Antarctica, it just looks like a little tiny plug in the, wow. in the corner of the, you know, right. of, of, of East and of West Antarctica. And so what they're saying is if, if, and Pine Island Glacier is a similar sort of size, and that's, right. that's just sort of around the corner and same sort of location. If those two glaciers themselves gave way, that would lead to something like five or six meters of sea level rise by, well, in quite short order, really, within within decades. Wow! So that's bad. That's but the other yeah. point the scientists are making is what it's not just that those glaciers would give way; they actually are plugs. So you right. take those plugs out, and the the big the actual glacier, the, oh, right, I'm behind. a proper glacier, yeah. you know, <laughs> that starts slipping then. Right, and, and, right. And if that now that wouldn't that wouldn't happen in decades, and certainly the the East Antarctica ice sheet would take hundreds, maybe even thousands right. of years. It is so thick. Right. But the even even the notion that it's starting to uh, quickly lose ice now, when yeah. we thought it was impervious, that's worrying enough. And 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 what yeah. they're saying is we're getting this double whammy of these these slightly strange meandering ocean currents because we've got you know massively superheated oceans i mean really very very hot 
very hot, very, very warm, much warmer than normal yeah. oceans. We've had the El Nino has, has turbocharged that this year. Yeah. So it's made ocean, warm ocean currents that wouldn't normally get anywhere near Antarctica. They have been able to infiltrate and, and, and upwell uh, deeper warm waters that is coming in and it's starting to to chip away at the you know ebb away at the at the at the glaciers yeah. from the water and we're getting these ridiculously warm air temperatures which are causing the 38 and a half degrees right. at, yeah. at, at, on east antarctica and that's that's and if that happened in it, the guy made a good point if th- plus 30 it's 38 and a half degrees celsius warmer, warmer than the seasonal yeah. norm if that happened in england in march we'd have had 50 degrees celsius yes. and we'd all, and we'd all be dead yeah, because we're not yeah. very good at fifty degrees Celsius. No. So it's only because it starts off so bloody cold in the Antarctic yeah. that you can get away with those sorts of ridiculous yeah. um, temperature differentials. But you can't get away with them forever, no. and that's why no. the science. So we're not saying the whole thing's going to fall off next Tuesday and no. we're all going to die. It's just the rate of change that's very very disturbing for the scientists yeah. that, that 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 study it, and and um, and even things like it's not just the ice you get. So if the land based ice melts into the water, obviously you get sea level rise. Um, if the sea-based ice goes, that doesn't change the sea level, but it changes the albedo, the reflectiveness. You've got less right. white ice, less reflectiveness yeah. going up to space, more heat is absorbed into the black, dark ocean, and therefore the quicker it all warms, and, the, and that's when you get your feedback, um, your feedback loops, yeah. that it accelerates. But they've also made the point that algae grows on these glaciers. Algae loves the right. bottom sides of these glaciers, and krill eat algae. Right. And algae obviously it photosynthesized to, to grow, so that stores carbon dioxide right. and gives out oxygen. So that's a very good. We need that. Yeah. So we want algae. Um, krill eat the algae. They poo and die, and then all that goes to the bottom of the ocean. And that carbon dioxide, that carbon, goes with them, right. and that's how it gets permanently stored on the on the deep ocean bed. That's right. a that's a system that nature has put into place that yeah. works really well. Once those glaciers start disappearing. The algae starts disappearing. The yeah. krill, you get less krill because they haven't got anything to eat. That means yeah. the fish and the whales and the penguins haven't got, got anything to eat. eat and yeah. the carbon's not being sequestered on the bottom of the ocean. I mean, yeah. you know, if you had to write a script of a disaster yeah. movie, yes. you'd, you'd, you know, you'd put all those things in, wouldn't you? Well, it's those, it's those feedback loops, isn't it? I mean, it is yeah. even like the sort of Siberia where the, the, the permafrost is melting. Oh, oh, how bad's that? Well, that means the staggering amounts of methane that are underneath it are starting yeah. to leak out. Yeah. In some cases, on colossal levels. I mean, which it... oh, it's eighteen hundred gigatons, I think, something like that. Oh, God. Which yeah. I mean, that's all. Not all that's going to come. again. Not all that's going to come out. But there are there are credible scientists who are saying you you, you might get fifty, and right. that could that could add you know a degree or two to the temperature yeah. of the Earth in 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 a matter of years. Yeah, because I think is... that we're in this peculiar situation in this country is that in in effect because of the Gulf Stream and new, and the position and being surrounded by sea, our climate is relatively stable, really, in terms of glo- globally. And then it's when you go to places like the, 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 the Far East or the Middle East or Australia is a good example, mm. where about 80% of casual conversations in Australia are about the weather yeah. because it's really extreme. You know? Yeah, oh, yeah. So they are yeah. living in, in, you know, it, it's, oh, God, it rained so much yesterday. How much rain? Like 14 inches in an hour. You know, it's like it's like if you stand under a bucket and pour it on you, that's yeah. the level of rain it is. It's just my, and then, then oh, it's really hot today. How hot? 48 degrees and 100% humidity. And you go, no. no. You know, we don't, we haven't got a clue. You know, having spent time there has really kind of highlighted how, narrow the band of weather we we exist in in this country which allows you to then go it's not that bad all this global warming stuff is fine and it really is just this cut maybe us in new zealand we're because yeah. as soon as you get off us and go go to the continent europe europe's the or fastest warming continent of uh, yeah europe southern europe yeah yeah southern but europe is becoming like sub-saharan africa yeah. and and the temperatures are coming up and the and the airborne diseases and the mosquitoes are yeah. coming up into europe and by 2050 if the way we're going they probably will have arrived in london yeah, oh, I think so. Mosquitoes. Well, we were sitting in our because it was bizarrely warm last night. And some neighbours came round, and we found two mosquitoes really? in April in the UK. And I mean, wow. they're not like Australian mosquitoes, which no. <laughs> drive drive SUVs. They drive SUVs and wear boots. <laughs> slightly, and they say, "Good eye, mate," as it flies past you. <laughs> they're a slightly different breed, but they were yeah. mosquitoes. They were tiny little mosquitoes, and, and you could hit. It's only because one went past my ear, and you, yeah. there's no other creature that makes that noise. 
Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. It's really, and I went, that is bonkers. I mean, we've had them here before. I've been aware that we've sort of had some weird, fairly benign mosquitoes, but right. not in April. You know, it's no, still pretty no. bloody cold. So they, they, these are all the things yeah. that people, you know, people don't don't really factor into their thinking again because they're not really told about it they think oh well, it'll be a couple of degrees warmer that'd be fine it'd be nicer in the summer that's yeah. not the that's not the point yeah. it's the fact that you know in in two or three million years we have we've gone colder we've gone through lots of ice ages but yeah. never in all that time have we gone above two degrees celsius of warming ever and certainly right. not in the, certainly not in the history of the human the species e- even right. any yeah. any kind of human but let alone human human homo sapiens yeah. even you know so homo sapiens two hundred thousand years or so old homo erectus probably two million years old never yeah. in any of that time have we gone over right. two degrees and now we're going to be at two two point seven degrees within probably 70 years yeah. so that's what the scientists are saying it's not just that it's going to be a bit warmer it's going to be every one degree celsius puts seven degree seven percent more moisture into the atmosphere right. so ex- every, uh, exactly as you've described that water is yeah. going to clump together with the weather systems and just just, just dump, dump itself in areas yeah. and absolutely devastate areas yeah. all the other areas are going to be drought there's going to be no food grown you know these are the things that 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 people need to start grasping and we don't want to, you know you don't want to put the fear of god at people but we do need to be uh, aware of the size of the challenge so that we can yeah. be aware that we need to take lots it of might actions mean to that fix we it. actually reduce as opposed to increase the amount of fossil fuels we burn exactly <laughs> Although it right. has it has dropped isn't it there's a couple of people there, there, there's been a one percent drop i don't know if you've seen this but there has been which a lot of people putting down to electric scooters in the in the, in the far <laughs> yes. east because there's so see- many of them yeah yeah but i don't yeah. know i mean i i don't you know it's very I, hard to know no i don't either i mean i i, I think it we, we are we are on a super tanker and it's very hard to stop a super yeah. tanker uh, uh, yeah. and and so uh, you know fossil fuels will be around probably for if we're honest yeah, probably time. probably decades and certainly yeah. oil extraction for petrochemicals and things well that'll be around for a long long time yeah yeah we haven't it's got a replacement different. yet that's no. a different thing altogether but the combustion is what we need to you need to really nail and my yeah. my hopefulness getting back to being a bit more optimistic is that we also haven't those same people that don't necessarily factor in the consequences of climate change aren't also able to necessarily understand the the the, the acceleration of an exponential curve in the transition yes. so the technologies that are coming along they're not on a linear line they are no. they are on an s curve and they, yeah. and so that will be a very rapid change that yeah. all of us and it's i think it's started now i think we're on the bottom side of that yeah. s curve um, and and so we're we're you know hold on tight because it's it's going to be an exciting ride. The next five or ten years, I think, will be absolutely pivotal. Yeah, what a brilliant moment to end on because we've actually gone over an hour. Oh my god, we have we really? Out. Yeah, yeah, one hour and two minutes. Like no, it's fine. fifteen it's minutes. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but that shows that's well, it was really that was a joy. Thank you so much for your time. Then that was really, really good. And we'll have to do it again. Yes, it's really definitely. good, and I mean, you know, there's an I can, I'm perfectly allowing to for people to say it's just two uh, follically challenged white gentlemen <laughs> yammering yes. with each other. True but enough, it's true, but also screw you because what we're saying is quite important. <laughs> I agree, quite right. <laughs> Great stuff. I will see you soon. Okay, thanks, Robert. Cheers. Sometimes when I do podcasts, it's quite hard work and I really have to know the topics and have to do the research beforehand and then have to talk to people I've never talked to before. With Dave Borlis, it's just a joy. It's just fun and we really enjoy it, even when I have a bit of a log jam or no logs in my consciousness river, which happened today. Uh, please do subscribe to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Please do have a look at the Everything Electric show and subscribe to that. Please do tell your friends about the work we're doing. Um, there's, you can have a look at the Patreon link uh, if you want to help support what we're doing because we're, as always, with all, all media companies, we're struggling, but we're getting there. Uh, and that's all. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening slash watching. <laughs>